Lightning Series. I'm here with a very special guest, Mayor George Flags from the city of Vicksburg. This is going to be a good conversation and we won't finish as quickly as we do sometimes. So I encourage you viewers to please bear with us or come back maybe at your convenience to watch our recording. Mayor, thanks for being with us today. Well, thank you and thanks for the opportunity and thanks for what you're doing. Um, making certain that the, the information gets out there into the public and uh, um, great to be here. Well, that's our goal. You know, I've got to share with our viewers a little bit about what we were talking about before we went live. It's uh, truly gratifying to see life come full circle and our viewers wouldn't know it, but you and my dad were in school together in Vicksburg in the 1970s and you know my extended family in Vicksburg today. So it's a special thing to be able to connect with you and I really appreciate you taking time. Um, and speaking of my dad, a uh, point of personal privilege here, it's his birthday. So dad, if you're watching, happy birthday. Uh, now, as we move into and this from conversation- me too, happy birthday. What's that? I said for me too, happy birthday. Right. Well, he'll appreciate that. I wanna pull the curtain back a little bit on how our city leaders are making decisions about what to do around COVID-19. You were an early adopter of precautionary measures. Would you tell us a little bit, tell our viewers a little bit about some of those early steps you took to mitigate the spread of COVID-19? Well, first of all, I, I recognize the seriousness of it from the White House briefing and then looking at the White House task force and I kept up with it. I'm an advocate of watching news and uh, keeping up information. Then the governor uh, was uh, in Spain at the time, but he came when he came back, he, he addressed it. And then I started looking at the CDC website and I look at the Department of Health and I knew then that we was about to uh, hit a crisis. So uh, being the, the person I am, my background is industrial technology, concentrating in safety and management from Jackson State, I thought that it was time for us to present uh, some super precaution uh, and some measurement that will get us ahead of the curve and have us better prepared. So uh, it was a no brainer really because uh, you can see it coming, uh, especially when you look at New York. Uh, at that time, it was Washington State that I was looking at, and then you start seeing what's going on the West Coast, and and there was all kind of data out there. So I just started saying, look, we need to be uh, proactive. So let's get out ahead of this. Uh, let's look at our employees first, uh, and then let's make sure they were safe, and then let's go to the community. And that's what we did. What are some of the things that you put in place to uh, to to you know, you said you started with employees. What was it you did for the employees and then and then for the community? Well, the first thing I did is that I was able to recognize that we had what you call a civil emergency uh, act where the mayor has total authority uh, for five days to uh, implement an emergency and then take it for the board. And thank God this board never uh, flinched on anything I was doing. So I put together a plan that it allowed us to uh, let 25% of the employees off. We started using precaution, like uh, making certain that we were using the, we was using hygiene, sanitizing, and those type things. I took one guy in, uh, out of rotation, and he started making certain all the bathrooms, and then we started closing down some of the public places because we thought that that was a carrier too, and then the governor came along with his emergency, and that's when the churches and thing and the business uh, start getting involved. And all I did is just look at ways that I thought that we can protect the community first uh, and at the same time continue to provide the service to the taxpayer. I love that, Mayor. I love that focus on your employees first, getting them in shape and then the community. That's, um, that's great leadership there. Uh, I want to get in the weeds a little bit on some data here and, and a, a, seri a serious topic, a topic that I, I find to be troubling, frankly. We're seeing in Mississippi and nationwide a disproportionate rate of infection and death from COVID-19 among African-American people. And in our state, the rates are showing that among all African-Americans, rates of death are from COVID-19 are around three times higher than they are in Caucasian or white, white, white folks. What, in your opinion, if you don't mind, what are your thoughts on that? What, what do you think some of those causes are for that disparity? Well, first, first of all, know that that data was not being reported at first. And at the beginning of it, what we had uh, was to be able to save and as many lives we could and mitigate mitigate uh, the spread of the virus. So it had nothing to do with race. What we had to do is to put precaution up to save people. 
Right. And then through uh, the, the first uh, re uh, reminder came out was that this was something just uh, for those that are vulnerable, underlying diseases or illness and this thing. And if you're above uh, 65 years of age, so we started looking at that. But then know that it was uh, when it starts spreading, it started affecting all uh, demographic and it started affecting all ages. And uh, so then we uh, start looking at the data that came out quite natural uh, when we saw that it was affecting African America. Uh, being an African American, I had no other choice to adjust to that. But uh, at the same time, uh, the adjustment was good for everybody. Uh, but uh, I was a little disturbed uh, about that it had a higher concentration on African Americans than uh, than any other race. But that's not because of their African American. It's because they were the highest population with the most uh, right. critical illness. Uh, and if you look at Mississippi, you look at Louisiana, you look at the dem demographic, and you look at the disparity, healthcare disparity, quite natural. But then it start uh, look going to New York, going to California, then you start looking at the data, then this disease was just uh, taking over all of the community. And your hot spot became New York City, Buffalo, uh, Detroit, Chicago, San Francisco. So uh, quite natural, we had to uh, act accordingly, but it was nothing we can do because of the fact is that it was attacking those that had been uh, underserved, the population. So what we had to do then is just try to mitigate it, mitigate it, and and do the best we can to make sure that there was a priority on that race if we could in terms of for the ventilators and for the testing and everything. But for the most part, it is unfortunate that it affected us more so than any other race. But uh, I'm confident that we're gonna learn from this and hopefully uh, not only just in my state, but in this whole country, we start looking at healthcare as a whole and look at the whole human aspect of healthcare and not by based on race. Healthcare should be, uh, in my opinion, uh, a right. It should be a privilege to anybody. Uh, I, I don't represent healthcare for all, uh, because I don't think we can universally provide healthcare to everybody. I don't think we can afford it my, based on my experience in the legislature, but we can certainly make certain that healthcare is more uh, accessible and affordable so that we can begin to erase some of the disparity uh, as it relates to healthcare. Well, that's my hope that this gets our attention and that it does shine the light on some of the disparities that we have and we can move uh, move the ball forward a bit in uh, in this fight and in this this game of life it's not it's uh, not not um, that it, it just is really unfortunate that we see such such stark disparities what are some of the uh, responses you've seen to COVID-19 across the community and and uh, do you think you mentioned that the, the way the news rolled out and our data that we got and that that might not have you know, it might be just now that the data is really uh, kind of shedding light on what's really going on underneath. Did that have an effect on uh, on the African American community and the belief about how serious this was, or you know, is it what might have been going on there? I think I don't think the data would have prevented anything. I think the data mm -hmm. just revealed uh, right. how it was affecting people. Uh, the data was good so that you could track. Uh, the number of people going into your hospital, the number of folks that were getting the case and from the community in which they was getting. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, CDC and the White House task force and uh, our governor and the Department of Health have done a great job on providing the information. Uh, but regardless, I don't think it's nothing the data would have done right. to prevent it. I think the data just tracked the reality of what was happening. And so yeah. because of that, we had to strategize and, and refocus on what it was going. And so it didn't say that if you was African-American, you get a priority over a ventilator versus somebody as a Caucasian or Caucasian. Right. You still had these healthcare protocol where you had to serve the people as best you could. And so yeah. I don't think I've seen anything that represent racism or anything that represent that black folks or white folks, white, black folks was underserved because of this disease. I think it just revealed what we already knew yeah. that it would affect those persons because it affect the underlying 
uh, help care of the people. If you had heart disease, if you had diabetes, if you had respiratory problems, it affect you quite naturally because this disease was a disease that attacked those uh, immunity system, those systems uh, in our bodies. Good points, Mayor. Good points, and I, I think you you know you're hitting the nail on the head that it's really uncovering what already what already existed. I mean, at least that's what I what I'm thinking may be going on. And so we're, I think we're singing from the same sheet of music on that. Um, uh, and I say this, can I say you, something else to that? Please, please. Let me just say this, because I'm a, I'm a politician. I'm an independent. I'm a methodical thinking person. I try to be rational when I'm in my thinking and in my decision. The last thing that I would want these statistics to do is to divide us up in a racial fight or political fight it's not necessary. What I want these statistics to do is allow all of us, Democrats, Republicans, black and white, men and women, to understand this data, uh, uh, assess this data, I mean, and analyze this data, and let's improve, let's learn from this. Out of everything bad that I've read in the Bible, some good came behind it. You know, I appreciate that. In Mississippi, we sure do hold our faith uh, dear, and and that's a that's a great place to go back to to look for inspiration for what's to come, and I think you're right. We've got to we got to look for the silver lining. We got to look for the find hope in the in the good that's to come from this. Who do you think we ought to be partnering with? You know, let's uh, you know, uh, being mindful of what you said. Who do we need to be partnering with to advance this issue um, and to get the word out that COVID nineteen is a real problem across races? And that we need to do uh, do more to take it seriously. Do what you're doing today. Uh, interview people across the uh, racial lines or across profession and everything, and, and include everybody in this and have a public discussion like we haven't about. Let's learn from this. Let's don't become so political divisive that we turn on each other. Let's just learn from this and move forward. And I think uh, under uh, the guidelines of the CDC, the uh, White House Task Force, and I've seen what Congress are working together now better than ever. Uh, they they passed some stimulus bill uh, with money in it, unanimous. So they need to get back to that where you use common sense, but at the same time, we got to continue to educate the public on what works and what's not working. The social distance work, uh, the wearing of masks work. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are, uh, are working. And we got to uh, empower the community to understand and encourage them to use all these precautions because it saves life and it, mitigate, it mitigates the spread of this disease uh, so that we can get out of this. But at the same time, we have to listen to uh, the experts. We have to listen to some of the politics. We got to learn from New York, uh, Detroit, uh, in, uh, Chicago, and that is that what happened is that we was not as prepared as we should have been prepared, but that's not to blame nobody. It's just that this caught us by surprise. And the second thing, it overwhelmed our healthcare system. So what we got to do now is go back and and, and restock, mm -hmm. re-educate the healthcare professionals, give them the tools they need. And at the same time, we got to come with uh, testing that gives quicker results. Uh, we got to come up with a vaccine that uh, if this come back again, we are prepared for it. Uh, we can't let this divide us. We have to let this bring us together with a common idea and approach on how we going to do it. America is better than, than always being divisive when something happens. This has been the greatest crisis of my career, the greatest crisis of my life, and I'm 67 years old. So what I'm simply saying is just like we learned from Pearl Harbor, just like we learned from the Spanish flu, just like we learned from AIDS, just like we learned from other disease. Let's learn from this and make certain that the United States uh, are, are, uh, will be prepared better than ever before. And let's learn. Uh, I tell folks, I'm an old athlete. You learn more from losing than you do from winning. Well, we're not going to lose this battle, but I think we're in the in in the in the fight uh, for our life right now. As a uh, literally, I think we turn into Kona, though. I we are. We, we are. I think we're in a fight, and it's unfortunate that in order to get out of this ballot, uh, a lot of lives been lost. Uh, but we're right at 42, 43,000 people that died as a result of this. But guess what? 
they're not the numbers that they projected. They, they started That's off right. saying 100,000, 200,000, 1.2 million. That don't say that if uh, uh, that won't happen. We're just not there yet. But if we let down our gods, if we stop being uh, proactive, we stop being precautionary about uh, the light, uh, about what's going on, we'll get to those numbers. We got to understand. Whatever happened before this viral, however you live before this viral, that's over. Mm -hmm. Never in the history where you didn't see uh, uh, where uh, more than 10 people couldn't be together or more than 50 people couldn't be together. Never in the history we've seen as many uh, conventions and, 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 and venues, those things that had large venues uh, wouldn't happen. So we got to learn from this uh, because, uh, and you got to retrofit some things. But I don't see us going and taking every other seat out of stadium. I don't see us having football or basketball or those normal things, whereas that you don't have people in the stand forever. I think we're bigger than that. I think we're going to come back, and we're going to come back stronger and better. Well, I, I, that certainly is my hope as well. Uh, Mayor, I th you, you, you've got me excited. You've gone from a political from a from a political speech and just an interview to preaching, and it's got me it's got me inspired to, to do more and be better. And I really appreciate your insights. What advice would you give to uh, to other cities? You know, like I said, I, you've been an early adopter. You've been a leader in uh, in taking this seriously even before the the governor came out with uh, the, the shelter in place order. So what, what advice would you give to other cities? What would you say has worked effectively uh, in, in Vicksburg to minimize the impact? And um, I, I'd love to just well, hear let, you. Let me, let me say this because you said something about me being a preacher. I'm not a preacher, but I am a man that believes in God. And I believe that uh, when you have a faith and a belief in God, it leads you in a way that you listen and learn and then you lead. Uh, and having said that, let me just say this. And that is, I think, every politician from a corner to a, uh, a law enforcement, uh, all the way up to the president, all to learn from this. And what we ought to do to understand, always, always take the advice from the expert. When it's a crisis like this, listen to medical people. Listen to those folks that know what they're talking about. I'm not a doctor, but I can certainly listen to a doctor. And at the same time, let's always use the precaution. If they say, and the CDC have said it, and uh, the, the White House Task Force has said it, the governor has said it, and the Department of Health has said, if the masks work, wear them. If social distance work, then separate. Let's do this until we find a vaccine. Let's do this until we get enough testing out there to represent uh, enough that we can quantify uh, well, exactly what we need to do and how much we need and where we need to put whatever we need to put. Mayor, one, one question, we don't necessarily always like to look back and say what we would have done differently, but is, if there if we could hit the rewind button, is there anything you would do differently? Well, for me, I, yeah, for, for my respect, this crisis, right. Well, my respect, uh, the only thing I see that I would do different is that uh, when this first started, I fed those persons that were vulnerable, that were 65 and older, underlying people in the community. We fed over 700 people a day for two weeks uh, and two days. Uh, I wish we had not started this serving of that food as early. Uh, we uh, we uh, should be doing it right now. That's the only thing I do if I would delay it on serving. But I had to uh, make certain if these people are going to be sheltered in, and, 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 and stay home, I had to make certain that they had a hot meal, a nutritious meal within their house. That was the least we can do. The Bible speaks to uh, that you're always supposed to take care of the least of thee. And when you take care of the least of thee, everybody else can take care. Of. That's the only thing I would have done different. Uh, the employee, I'm satisfied before bringing them back to work. We did a temperature test of them. We told them that if you had underlying disease, that you didn't have to come to work. We paid them for three weeks. We paid our first uh, 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 first uh, line people, our, our firemen and our paramedics and our, our police houses pay. We pay people to stay at home so they didn't have to depend on going to unemployment, those things. I took care of our employees and I hope they will appreciate that. But at the same time, you always start from within. 
and then make certain that you're using all the calls. And so my employees should be the example to the public. If you, you wear masks, good. we close off the public. Uh, we're not, we talk about reopen. Uh, I'm going to announce tonight a reopen phase based upon what the governor gives me the authority to do. But guess what? I'm not gonna open my whole city back up in one week. Uh, I brought the employees back this week. Everything's going fine. Uh, they've been tested. I ordered uh, 25 of the temperature testing. Uh, you can be tested. Uh, we're going to use a lot of different protocols in, in, in our public safety. Uh, we're going to teach a whole lot. Now I'm going to go to the restaurants and the beauty parlor, open them up, and then the next week another phase because I want to be able to track the data on bringing them people back into this uh, open society. Rather than I don't care what nobody said. I'm not just going to open the door like a switch and say, you know, we open for beer and let's go. No, I'm not doing that. I, what I'm going to do is uh, methodically phase back into this city so I can measure the data. Uh, and that data is how many people are dying in my community? How many people are being affected by this in my community before I bring on the whole population? Mayor, you talked about listening, learning, and leading. And I'm hearing you also a theme here is data-driven decision-making. And that's so important in this time. Oh, absolutely. That's my background. I'm in industrial yeah. technology and concentrated in, in the healthcare, I mean, safety and personnel. But I really want to be an engineer. My son is a, an engineer and a lawyer. And I think he, he took away from what I really want to be. But because I fell short in being an engineer, that don't mean that I couldn't learn uh, uh, those things that are very important. I've always been data grilled. That, if it, let me just tell you something. I've always, even my politics, is that if you mathematically can't do it, you can't solve a problem. Mm. That's good. You every, know, problem, every problem is a denominator. <laughs> there you go. I like that. And you give me lots of sound a, Look at if A and Z and Y is a variable, it means I can solve every problem. Well, and we can typically fit a problem to a model like that. And that's well, you have to. Yeah. Data yeah. data is so important. Uh, and that's why we need to collect it. That's why I I, I try to read a lot of data. And I didn't just create all this myself. I watched it what New York was doing. I watched what Washington State was doing. When I saw San Francisco with 40 million people send 7 million people home, I knew then we had a crisis. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to wait on the president. I got. I don't have to blame the president. I had to be proactive. Yeah. I had to err on the side of caution and not on the side of blaming nobody. I don't blame nobody. All I want is the opportunity to get out of this and let the experts, the healthcare providers, uh, rethink what we're doing and let's be better prepared if this comes back. Well, Mayor, I'm I'm taking away from this. You know, you, you're talking about this from a city leader's perspective, but families have leaders, churches have leaders, businesses have leaders, it, and so I I think what the point you just made about you as a city leader didn't have to wait on the president or the governor to to lead, and it, it doesn't matter what organization we're in or what family we're in or what we as leaders at the level that we've been given responsibility can lead uh, even without that mandate from, from above. And I really appreciate that insight. That's that, good. Hey, we have, we have a self responsibility to society. We have a self obligation to society. We have a self uh, uh, a moral obligation to each other. The Bible said we are our brothers keep mm -hmm. uh, as a politician. Uh, if I'm going to be successful, then I got to be effective. If I'm going to be effective, then I got to make certain that the things that I do and the tools I use are very effective. It just makes sense. Yeah, you're right. Personal responsibility is so important, you know, because we in Mississippi, we really like our personal freedom. We don't like the government telling us what to do. And the truth is not a lot of places do. But uh, we've got as these restrictions are lifted, we've got to take personal responsibility for things like you've already mentioned, like wearing that mask, staying at home unless we just absolutely have to get out for for the foreseeable future. And and washing your hands and sanitizing yourself. The, the hygiene is so important. Uh, the other part of this, what they don't understand is that this disease is airborne. 
So be careful coughing in people's face. Be careful uh, sneezing. Uh, be careful picking in your face and then not uh, sanitizing yourself behind. Be careful with going to uh, the bathroom, going to eat. This thing are also going to teach us not just hygiene, it's going to teach us a lot of etiquette too. You're, you're right. We call it respiratory etiquette. Isn't that, isn't that a funny Absolutely. Name? That's there what we, go. Talk, we talk about with our kids is respiratory etiquette. So I, that's right. a, and we have to, And we have to be leaders by example. If our children see us do well, if our children see us use precautionary measures, then they're going to use them. You're right. And, you know, and if you, people see you as a mayor wearing your mask, they're going to be more likely to use it. You know, or, or at least if they saw you not using it, they, they would just discard that advice. They, so I think the fact that you're wearing your mask right here so that when you go outside immediately, you can put it on. That's great leadership. That's Dave, leadership. I have, David, I've been the kind of person that I always try to lead by example. I've never asked any of my employees, any of my family to do something I wouldn't do. That's the most dangerous thing. Dude, my mama didn't teach me and my daddy teach me, do what I say and now that you see me do. And they, neither one of them had any uh, form of education, but they gave me value. They gave me direction. They gave mm -hmm. me a sense of pride about who I was and uh, those type things. And I thank them uh, from above that they, these values that I thought uh, was the meanest thing in the world uh, now help me. I remember my daddy making me cut a yard, uh, uh, a whole yard over because I missed a spot. He said, son, if you ain't got time to do it right the first time, you ain't got time to do it right the second time. These are very, they instilling me. Uh, the point that it was for us boys, we was picking up pecans to sale. All four of the boys wanted to tree. Daddy couldn't read and write, but he said, son, y'all come down. All of you come down. Well, that didn't make sense for one of you go up the tree, shake the tree, and the other three pick up. These are the values that I got from my parents that I still use. And I said that to say this, that's called collaboration. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what it was then, but now it's collaborate. Use the best resources you can at the best time you can so it could be the least call to the taxpayer. Incredible, Mayor. Incredible. Uh, you know, I like to wind up our, our conversations with a with an opportunity for the guests to leave us with two or three snippets that that you want our, our viewers to remember. Is there you've said a lot, a lot of really important and helpful things. What would be the last, you know, couple of things you'd want to or maybe a recap on something you've already said that you think's most important for us as we continue to navigate this crisis? Take this virus serious. Use all the precaution. Do as the experts say. Follow them, not the politicians. Follow the leaders. The leaders are the experts. The people around the White House that are a part of the task force, uh, the health care providers, uh, uh, Dr. Dahl uh, at the state level. Follow the experts. Listen. Be reasonable. Know that this is serious. Take no chance with it until we get out of this. And by all means, Let's take care of each other. We're all in this together. Mayor Flags, thank you. I really, again, appreciate you so much for taking time to be with us today. And viewers to you, thanks for sticking with us. As I said at the outset, this was a little longer than our normal conversations, but it was well worth it. I walked away with several uh, nuggets of, of truth and insight for my own leadership moving forward that I'm, I'm grateful for. And I hope you did as well. I invite you to leave comments uh, in the in the feed below about what has been meaningful from this conversation, as well as ideas for what we can talk about as we move into the future. I uh, couldn't thank you enough for sticking with us and Mayor Flags, again, I appreciate you. As always, I encourage our listeners to stay vigilant and stay healthy.